Hello. Um, I'm Max. I'm Ian. This is uh, Dr. Professor Bogos. Doctor, how to talk to Prof yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in terms of uh, our conversation, I think we have about 45 minutes, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, interrogate Ian about the book, make him define his terms, and we'll talk about uh, some uh, some philosophy and games topics, and then we have about 15 minutes of questions at the end, so you can start preparing your uh, your tough questions, and I'll. Uh, as the moderator, I'll uh, hold Ian's feet to the fire, so he has to, uh, he has to answer on topic. Um, so uh, I felt like uh, in terms of um, having a, a philosophy conversation, we should just start with uh, the obvious, which is defining some terms. So the three terms that I um, picked out as pretty key in the book are uh, ga uh, a game, playing, and fun. Um, and you had some pretty interesting definitions of those. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so the, the strange thing about all of these terms, game, play, and fun, is that we, we use these words all the time, and we, we kind of don't know what any of them mean. I mean, I, I mean, actively, we don't know. If you sort of stop when you, when you hear yourself saying that something was fun, and you ask, well, what, what did I mean by that? It turns out that it's like this filler word. Like when you, you know, how are you, I'm fine. It's just a way that you sort of get through the conversation. And all three of these are like this uh, in different ways. So maybe we'll start with game. Um, so one of the strange things about games is that if you think about other, f we, we think of games as a kind of media form nowadays, like computer games or, or tabletop games, or, and then there's, you know, there's sports, or sp sports are kind of like a game, but then we talk about how you can, how you can kind of make a game out of anything. So it's this, this strange, squishy term. Um, and if, if you compare it to other media forms, you kind of see the difference. So, so if literature is like the aestheticization, the aesthetic form of language, or dance is the aesthetic form of human movement, then you know, what would be the equivalent for, for games? And one of the problems is that games seem to be a kind of a, almost like a, a, a meta form. It applies to many different kinds of experiences. So that means we have to give a more abstract answer to that question. And one answer would be that, to follow that pattern, if literature is the aesthetic form of, of, of language, then games are the aesthetic form of material constraint, <coughs> of, of limitation, which is, you know, it's abstract, not very helpful yet. We need to make it more helpful by looking at some of the other terms. So play, if we play, we know that we play games. What does that mean? Um, well, kind of dig into that idea of material constraint. Play is the process of manipulating the capacities of something, working within the constraints and limitations that it provides. You know, when you play soccer, you agree to attempt in a team to move a ball around a, a pitch into a, a goal uh, without using certain parts of your body. Those are, those are the, the material constraints that form the basis of the, of the sport. Or when you play Tetris, you manipulate four squares stuck together in different patterns such that they form other kinds of patterns in, in an attempt to, to remove lines as they fall from the screen. And those, those things are given, and you're working within those, those limitations. And what this does is it moves, it moves the terms into this thing itself, which is why you can play with, with anything. I can play with a cup, or you, know, you can play with your food. That's, that's where that idea comes from. All right. So the other weird thing about play in games is that we have this whole aesthetic category or this whole sort of experiential um, category of fun that we kind of limit or that, or that we think of as having something to do with, with games and play. But you know, games are, um, a good game is one that's fun. Okay, that, like, that's not the no way that we would talk about literature or film or art uh, in such a kind of a brute, brute force sort of way. But again, we don't really know what it means. We just use it as a filler. And one of the reasons we use this filler, I think, is that we haven't fully come to terms with, uh, with the idea of games as the, the aesthetic form of, of limitation. So what fun is for me, um, it's, like, it's like the exhaust that's produced when you manipulate something. Uh, it's not something that is in you, it's not the experience of pleasure, it's the result of having, having worked with some part of the world in a way that something new happened. Or another way of putting it is that fun is the discovery of novelty or even more so, fun is the experience of finding something new in something familiar. That seems to be very important for fun. Uh, the more familiar, the more sort of suffocatingly 
familiar something is, the less work you have to do to produce, to produce fun uh, with it, because there's that, that sort of depth of, of familiarity such that when something new happens, uh, it's immediately gratifying and, and, and pleasurable. And the strange thing about like, all, of these, <coughs> all of these terms, or my take on all of these terms, is they, they don't really correspond with the, the ordinary and popular definitions or the sensibilities that we have of these concepts at all, which makes the work of talking about them uh, pretty onerous. Yeah, I think um, um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the sort of like interesting um, uh, topics in the book and, and something that comes up when, you're, when you are discussing fun is like the relationship of like games to desire. So games people sometimes talk about games being addictive or juicy or um, mind, you know, just like you lose yourself in the experience. And I think there's like a real um, uh, collision of like high art and low art of like satisfying human desire meeting the intent yeah. of the artist. Um, and there was a um, there was a little anecdote in the book um, that I thought it'd be fun to read about uh, the creation of the Cheeto and how we sort of um, look at Cheetos that sort of opened up uh, a way of like looking at looking at games and um, yeah yeah you want to read that yeah you want me to read that okay yeah yeah you so should, this give is us, give us a dramatic reading. I brought the book out so that we could do this and I've um, I've marked a few passages that we talked about with drink coupons for Delta Airlines. So I just need to, just need to flip through and find the right, yeah, here it is. Um, all right. Is there really any difference, the writer Jeb Boniakowski once asked, between highly engineered and processed foods, like the kind you find at McDonald's, and molecular gastronomy, the application of food science to cooking that became popular in modernist haute cuisine establishments like El Bulli and Alinea. Boniakowski draws a powerful conclusion that should be obvious in retrospect, and this is Boniakowski now. I've often thought that a lot of what makes crazy restaurant food taste crazy is the solemn appreciation you lend to it, but we tend to limit our indulgence of that appreciation, and, and here's a, a, a quote from this, this article of, of Boniakowski's in which he's kind of illustrating this point, which I wish I'd written, but I didn't. If you put a Cheeto on a big white plate in a formal restaurant and serve it with chopsticks and say something like, it is a cornmeal canal, extruded at a high speed, <laughs> and so the extrusion heats the cornmeal polenta and flash cooks it, trapping air and giving it a crispy texture with a striking lightness. It is then dusted with an umami powder glutamate <laughs> and evaporated dairy solids blend. People would go nuts for that. So do you do you have uh, you know in, in, in talking about and trying to balance you know all of the the sort of like human human desires of of playing a game and having fun and then the sort of seriousness that uh, you know the artistic seriousness that um, some of your own work speaks to and certainly like the the discussion of games in the book speaks to do you have a way of like meeting meeting in the middle somewhere? Well, one of the premises of the book and it took took me a long time to come to this conclusion. It's kind of a big shift for me, is that that the interesting thing about play is that it applies to anything. I mean, it's in the title, so it must matter. But you know, that idea, that, that high-low art distinction just kind of breaks down with play and with games. We've known that for a long time. We've always felt that, that, that there's a strong sense that there was something grotesque about games, but yet it's also something very alluring. You already mentioned the connection to, to gambling and to addiction and to compulsion. Uh, and that's one of the things we play with when we, when we play games. One of the delights of, of casino gambling is, is testing uh, the limits of contingency and of wisdom uh, that's why we ply ourselves with alcohol in order that we can feel those, 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 those distinctions, those limits sort of, sort of drift away, um, the pleasure of losing money. Um, and so the, the, the lesson, I think, to, and this is a hard lesson because, we, because we've, gotten, we've got this idea that games are, are, are a kind of aesthetic form or a media format or something akin to literature or, or cinema, uh, when in fact what they are is a particular way of structuring anything in the material world. You know, so we, the, the idea that we can manipulate something like, like, uh, uh, like foodstuffs in order to create an aesthetic experience and that it might be different when it's in a bag of Cheetos uh, than, when, than when it's at a fine dining establishment is an interesting example. But the fact that you can, uh, the, you know, you can play with the, with the rock that you found in the street by, by, by kicking it and seeing how far you can take it um, or that you can, uh, that you can play with a, a pen in your hands or, or, or with a doodle on, the, on a scrap paper while you're on the telephone would you, do you want to tell, I mean, one of the sort of foundational um, uh, like stories in the book is, is your visit to the mall with your daughter. Do you want to sort of tell that Yeah, tell there's, that there's this, this story I opened the book with. Um, many years ago, I, was, I took 
on some errands at this mall in, in Atlanta, and I had my daughter, and she was about <coughs> four, four years old at the time, and I was just so you know focused on getting through the errands and out of the mall. I just like, it was awful. Didn't want to be there. Um, I was there for a purpose and a reason, and you know I just wanted to get through it. And we were walking, you know, we we're walking through the mall, and I would, I don't even remember what we were doing, and I kind of felt her. I was trying to pull her through all the crowds, and I felt her kind of resisting, and. And, and, and I wasn't sure what she was doing. I was a little bit annoyed, like, let's just go get it done. Uh, and I looked at her, and she was sort of just staring straight down at her feet, trying to time her footfall so that her feet fell within the, the square ceramic tiles on the mall floor. And because I had her hand, she didn't have to look where she was going, and she was small, and there's all these legs going around her and everything. It was like this theme park ride almost, you know, and it's this sort of, you know, step on a crack variant in a certain way. But she, and she didn't know about that, and she, she had just sort of naturally taken all of these, these arbitrary materials that she found around her and assembled them into an experience. And we can call that a game if we want, and we, you know, that's okay, and, we, and sometimes we use that as a rationale for connecting games and play to, to, to children and, and, and to, to the capacity of children for creativity and flexibility. Um, but, but the truth is that it wasn't really her, it wasn't just her that was, that was implicated in this play experience. It, was, it had more to do with the mall and the tiles and the grout and the legs and me pulling her and, and all of those things uh, were necessary for this, for this thing to emerge that we call the game. So like another way of thinking about, about play is by um, contrasting it with the way that we typically think of or talk about it. And often play is, is presented as the opposite of work, uh, or play is a kind of freedom. Play is where you get to do what you want rather than doing what you have to do. Uh, but in fact, once you see play as, a, as the manipulation of, of, of limitations and constraints, then you realize that's exactly wrong. Because if you, if you really could do whatever you wanted, then what would you do? You'd have no structure in which to do the thing itself. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the mall game is, is an interesting example because it shows us that, that when we play or when games emerge, they emerge out of, uh, out of limitation. And then we need to be willing uh, to kind of meet the world you know, halfway or even more so and say, okay, this is ridiculous, this is arbitrary, but nevertheless, nevertheless, I'm gonna see what I can do with it. Um, in, so in the book, you, you go through, um, it, um, one of the things I, I, I loved about this book is it sort of ties together a lot of these different schools of thought about games and people trying to, desperately trying to define games and pin them down. And um, so you talk about uh, the magic circle and subversive play, um, which we can, we can touch on, but um, ultimately kind of land on um, uh, Huizinga's uh, idea of like homo, homo ludens, uh, where like, um, uh, like a man is the species that plays. Um, and his sort of thesis is that uh, play is the manner in which culture is produced. Um, so you wrote about that. Uh, <clears throat> even if play produces fun, the basic experience of play is not letting loose or doing whatever you want, but carefully and deliberately working with the materials uh, one finds in a situation. Um, and then, you know, in that chapter, you also talk about um, sort of the uh, what you call the work-play differential, and there's like a complete deconstruction of the sort of difference between work and play as as opposites. Yeah, and this this is related to this point I was just making about uh, you know play as the opposite of work. It's kind of what the work-play differential is in a in a nutshell. And when we think of things that way, we've kind of doomed ourselves to misery. Because once you think, well, I mean, there's stuff I have to do, and then when I'm done with the stuff that I have to do, then I can get on to the stuff that I want to do, um, then you'll, you will never reach the stuff you want to do. You'll never a be able to do it. Because even when you finish your, your, you know, your, your, your day job or whatever, and then you think, well, finally, I'm done. Now I, can, now I can get on with it. Oh, no, but I have to drive home in traffic, and then you do that. And, okay, well, I've gotten home now, but oh no, there's dinner to cook, or there's children homework to work on, or I've got to take out the garbage, or I've got to mow the lawn. Uh, once I get through that, then finally I'll be able to get to the good stuff. Uh, and then the good stuff kind of never arrives, or when it does, it's not, it's not possible to treat it as good stuff anymore, because you've, you've worked yourself up into such a tizzy of exhaustion and desperation and misery uh, from having had to overcome all of the rest of it, um, that it too becomes work. Uh, so how, you know, how, to, how to work with or how to overcome that, that differential? Uh, well, I mean, it seems obvious in retrospect, but if we treat everything as not a work or a play experience, but as an experience in which play is possible, in which there are uh, constraints and limitations around what can be done, and the, the joy or the delight or, or just, just the, the aesthetic experience 
is in identifying those, those limitations and, and working with them, working within them, or, or maybe finding ways of pushing them out slightly. Then, the, then your work life, or your commute, uh, or your errands, or your childcare duties, or your yard care and gardening, or whatever it is, uh, those become play experiences. And there's an important distinction for me here that uh, may be a little bit esoteric unless you follow this stuff, which is that it's, it's not about um, gamify, this is gamification movement that's on, where you know, games are delightful, people love playing games, so let's, let's put games in our workplaces and our health insurance and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and this is just exactly the opposite of what I'm suggesting, because it assumes that, well, here's the good stuff, let's like, take it and spread it on the terrible stuff. Whereas, in fact, what we want to do is find, uh, find what's already there in the yeah, supposedly I think, I think terrible stuff. in the book you call that uh, broccoli uh, covered chocolate in chocolate. Chocolate covered broccoli, Yeah, right, which is somehow yeah. worse than just eating the broccoli. Yeah, 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 like if you have some nice broccoli, you know, you can tolerate it, even if you're not a broccoli fan. And chocolate, obviously, is pretty easy to tolerate, but chocolate on broccoli is worse uh, than, either one, than either one alone. Yeah, and, and the relationship to this, um, this Dutch uh, anthropologist, uh, uh, Johan Hoitzinger, uh, is, is that he, he's been saying this the whole time. This is, book was published in the 1930s, and, and you know, the, the idea that, that human culture is one of play and playfulness has been kind of strangely interpreted, in the, especially in the games uh, community, because we take that to be a validation of our chosen aesthetic form. Like, oh, this is great, you know, man is built to play, great. I'm on the right track in my career. Uh, whereas, in fact, what, what Hoisinger is saying is that everything we do in human civilization is play. And the process of creating culture, uh, it, it takes place through this exercise of, of working within these, these, these constraints and limitations of constructing uh, behaviors and laws and, uh, and, uh, and, and traditions and so forth um, out of those material forms, or building new material forms in which we can constrain the activities we partake of. So like counterintuitively, in Hoitzinger's um, uh, analysis, things like the court is a form of play. And you can kind of see it when you think about it as theatrical and there are certain rules that apply and you speak in a different way than you would in, in, in ordinary life. And because we've erected those, those limitations, the, that's the, the proper way of going about uh, 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 meeting out justice, then through it, the concept of justice uh, is possible to be thought. Well, it's a super, super contemporary, uh, uh, the, the dreaded uh, election tie-in to that. I mean, I've heard some people sort of, you know, I think, I think everyone in, in like political science and academia is trying to like make heads or tails of, of what's going on in this election and trying to understand what, what Trump is doing and the appeal of Trump. And one of the really compelling explanations that, that I've heard is there's like, do you know wrestling, the idea of kayfabe, which is like the, uh, in professional wrestling, there's this like the idea of like the story that the wrestlers are doing. They have this thing called kayfabe, which is they, they never talk about it. So it makes the reality of the, the wrestling like uh, real for the audience. And uh, one, my favorite um, sort of uh, analysis of, of, of this election is like Trump has broken political kayfabe. Like there's a way that everyone in politics plays the game, and he's not playing by those rules. And in, in the book, you talk about the idea of. Um, the, the magic circle and, and breaking the magic circle. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, so there's this this w very frequently cited passage in, in, in Homo Ludens, uh, very frequently in, in game design and game study circles. Anyway, anyway, in which the uh, there's a whole litany of examples that that Hoitzinger uses. Uh, the, you know, the, the the playground, the 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 the, the court, the, the theater, and one of them is the magic circle, which of course has a, a kind of cultural meaning, but is also very lurid and you know allows us to aestheticize the experience of games in a certain way. But if you think about that idea of a circle, um, a magic circle or a playground as a, a real or ideal um, kind, of, kind of line drawn around something, like a circumscription. And you can do this uh, at any moment. You can just sort of stop and go, okay, like I'm, what can, I'm gonna hold this random stuff inside my arms and then say, well, uh, what can I do? What can I do with those materials? But then you can also look at the world as it is and, and kind of draw that conceptual circle around the things that are within it and ask, okay, like, how do they operate together? And there's always, like, many, these are all, like, there's a mess of them. And there's not, like, one of them. They're not neatly piled, and they don't touch evenly. Um, they're kind of nested and all on top of one another. And so one of the things, I mean, you find this in politics, but you find it everywhere. There's all sorts of different games being played. And you can be Machiavellian about that, of course, but you can also just be analytical. Like, you know, what are the different roles? What are the different goals? Uh, what are the different materials that are available? And being able to kind of step back and, and identify those kind of different stakes that are present is a useful way of kind of making head or tails of what's been happening um, this election season. But it's also a general principle that we could, we could apply 
Uh, as, a, as a game designer, do you have, have do you have any insight into? Uh, can you can you share with us uh, any sort of comforting insights about uh, the, <laughs> the state of the selection? Well, I mean, one of the interesting things about it actually is is the revelation that that this particular um, aspect of the political process has always been present. Uh, so, as ghastly as it is to sort of say, well, there's you know there are certain lines that we don't cross, for example, but in in some ways, you only know that once you see someone cross them, right, and, and they become subverted, and then you recognize, ah, uh, perhaps, perhaps we were uh, undervaluing uh, that, you know, that particular way of, of structuring the, the, a political behavior. So it's not all terrible, I don't think. I think there are, there are some, oh, well, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> next week would be a different, different conversation. Um, I mean, I don't want to be too kind of uh, antiseptic about it, but there's something kind of gross and antiseptic about, about games and game design. There's something a little bit autistic about games. And one of those things is the ability to sort of zoom out, to step back, and to go, OK, I've got all this stuff. What is it that I can do with it? And you know, one answer to that question is always something bad. I can manipulate this situation or this person or this scenario. Um, and so the, you know, the addiction or compulsion stuff that we see in games, one of the reasons that games and um, and like partial reinforcement psychology are, are intimately connected is because of that fact. Uh, but in so doing, we also, we also learn something about the potential that's present rather than idealizing it. This is a, there's a great and uh, very sad anecdote in the book about uh, a really well-known uh, game designer named Notch, who is the uh, creator of uh, Minecraft, that I think speaks to this kind of mentality. Could you have that? Uh, do we, yeah, do we yeah. That I've section? got a Delta, uh, a Delta uh, drink coupon. If anyone needs any Delta drink coupons afterwards. Yeah, this was, this was sort of a, a, a truly um, interesting and, and sad story to me because I think it really speaks to, for a lot of people who like work in the profession of, of game design, like uh, how, how they, you know, what, what they aspire to, I guess. Yeah, this, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit of the lead up and, it, and it's in this chapter on irony. And so one of the things that's been happening at this point in the book is, is this, th there's this theme of, uh, of kind of ironic distance, of maintaining ironic distance, and 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 one of the premises of the book is that uh, that play can help us uh, uh, bridge uh, that distance. Uh, but what, why? Like, how do we end up in this situation? That's sort of the lead up. Okay, so today, satisfaction is more elusive than ever. In part, the precarity of life after the 2008 global financial collapse and the Great Recession that followed it, and whose effects still linger, makes every transaction with the world feel suspect and risky. We fear that things might turn on us because we have good evidence that they can and do. But this condition has expanded from an economic to a cultural one. Even enormous material wealth doesn't stave off the spread of boredom. In late 2014, Minecraft creator Marcus Persson, who's known as Notch, sold his company to Microsoft for $2.5 billion. Notch published a depressive justification for his desire to recede from public life thanks to the impossibility of satisfying the onslaught of demands from his customers and fans. Another thing that can turn on you, it turns out. Then he bought a $70 million Beverly Hills mansion, along with all the furnishings, accessories, art, even the cases of champagne and tequila, even the ultra-luxury vehicles the real estate speculator who built the place had installed within its sprawling garage for staging. Notch, the man who made a blank canvas world in which you could make anything, used the spoils to buy a prepackaged, off-the-shelf billionaire's life. As for his fans, undeterred, they dutifully reconstructed a version of the $70 million mansion in Minecraft. Um, Notch, of course, also has uh, come out in support of Trump. Yeah, uh, yeah, sort of an interesting turn of events, and uh, I also had a, a fun thing I discovered. Uh, I, I was uh, pulling up the book on Amazon the other day, and under the customers also bought section oh, was the uh, MAGA mindset by Mike Cernovich. The, really? uh, yeah, the yeah. Uh, the uh, the guy who says the problem with uh, American politics is everyone has uh, doesn't have enough testosterone, and the uh, alpha males have uh, lost control of the political process. Great, that's a nice connection to know that I'm making. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, well, let's, uh, should, we, should we talk about irony for a minute? Yeah, I, I mean, let's was, do that, yeah. but, but I mean, yeah. before we leave the, the, no, yeah. the notch anecdote, I mean, yeah, the, yeah. the interesting thing about it is this, which leads into irony, is this sense, that sense that that workplace differential problem is really everywhere. So, you know, oh, if, if I could only have a better job, um, or if I could only make more money, 
but then, of course, it never works out. And, and Notch is a great poster child for this because it's hard to imagine a better situation. There's this random guy who you know, makes a cultural uh, 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 you know, kind of touchstone, uh, this strange game that it kind of shouldn't have worked but, but did, and kids play it and grown-ups play it. Uh, oh, and then it's a financial success, and then he sells it to Microsoft for billions of dollars, and he's still miserable, and can't even can't even turn that misery into into a kind of kind of interesting wealthy accessory, right? Just just doesn't know what to do with his uh, uh, doesn't know what to do with his newfound freedom, supposedly. So none of us really have that freedom in the first place. Um, so this uh, the um, uh, the sort of a notch discussion is um, a part of the the chapter on irony. And um, you sort of laid out a um, like a comprehensive theory of irony that I found I found really compelling. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, so you know, originally as a as a as a, as a kind of rhetorical trope, irony meant uh, saying or doing the opposite of what you meant. But then um, over the course of the last twenty five years or thirty years, and then the last ten years in particular. Irony has sort of shape-shifted a bit, and now it means something more like refusing to acknowledge whether you really meant to mean what you said. So there's this, there's this kind of strange netherworld, this sort of like vat of undecidability in which every statement, every act, every purchase, every engagement with anything is neither revealed to be sincere nor contemptuous, but might always be one or the other. And that's sort of con that's contemporary irony. Uh, in a nutshell, and the the way that irony has been aestheticized, and the way that we kind of blame it on on, on like you know Williamsburg hipsterdom as well, uh, is related to this, and it's related to this anxiety, even the anxiety of precarity that that was in in that material on on, on Notch, uh, when everything is potentially threatening, because it it refuses we, it refuses to yield to us, to service us, to pleasure us in the way that we might expect or demand that it does, uh, then you begin to put up these defenses. And some of them are justified, and some of them are not. But then once you start, you kind of can't stop. Um, so we hold, um, the ironic maneuver is holding, holding things at a distance. And this, is, this is constant, and it's everywhere. Uh, and, and it's certainly something that, uh, that technology has helped facilitate. I'm going to go out on Saturday night and do something. What am I going to do? Well, let me just sort of wait and see what happens. And maybe you, you know, send me, like, you want to go out and get, get a drink or, or have, have a dinner? Like, yeah, maybe. I'm just kind of waiting to see what, what comes up, and then, and then you're like, oh, well, nothing's, uh, we'll, we'll go out and get a drink, sure, but then I'm just making sure there's nothing more interesting that might, that might come along, right? Um, one of the ways I talk about it in, in the book is this sort of proverbial uh, 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 plastic covering on the sofa. So everything gets, you know, gets covered in this sort of weird blister pack such that it can be preserved. Uh, but then, of course, you can never really uh, engage with it. And, and of course, the moment that you, that you start doing that, you kind of, you kind of can't ever stop. Uh, and then that, that, that ironic maneuver becomes the standard one. Um, so yeah, so this experience of holding things at a distance and then of, um, of kind of celebrating the holding of things at a distance. Um, there's, there's also an idea of like play as um, like a bridging the gap between earnestness and contempt. Yeah, so, so you know, that ironic maneuver, that sort of, the, the, when, you, when you make that arresting kind of gesture, it's actually somewhat productive. It's related to this idea of the magic circle or the, or the circumscription that's required for play to take place. Because you've stopped and noticed something in the world. You're like, okay, there's a thing here. Ah, you know, what am I going to do? And, and there's an act of, um, of attention that takes place. Uh, but then it stops. Like, nothing is what I'm going to do. Or I'm only going to talk about what I might do in order that what I really do not disappoint me. And then you start talking about the act of talking about doing it. It's so like you know memes and and all of the all of the other kind of uh, uh, experiences of uh, uh, of technological creativity, so supposed creativity that we that we have online, also amplify this effect. Um, and but if if you simply said, okay, well here's the thing, like now I'm going to dig in, now I'm now I'm going to do the thing, what, whatever it is with it, then you move from irony into play. So I, I I don't think we get to resolve that anxiety, that sort of oscillation. Um, it's 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 like this sort of this sort of hum. Like a fluorescent light, you know, producing producing this this hum and this 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 headache, um, which I call ironoia in the book, is this 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 like condition of anxiety that irony creates around things, which is kind of akin to the to the anxiety that paranoia creates with people. Um, yeah, the, the solution to it is is not is not that it gets resolved, but that you can actually dig in and begin working with and manipulating the 
uh, the entities that you find in the world, the people, the situations, the, the material objects, um, and then uh, discovering something new about them in order that, uh, uh, not so much that you can be gratified, but so that you can discover what was already there. Um, well, just to, um, I had a couple of, of questions just to um, take a step back and, and talk about the book itself and make the, uh, the meta uh, uh, jump that we were yeah, just, as we were that, required we were just, to do uh, on the subject, right? Yeah, yeah. that we were just uh, lamenting. Um, so I, th I just thought this was the, the scope of this book was pretty enormous, and I think it really gracefully kind of connects all these ideas, and then also like uh, um, you know it, it sort of gradually lays out this language and this framework for for talking about everything. Can you talk about how you like where do you where do you like put you know where where is like the ground of this book? Like how did you like get a purchase on on all of this and start to you know weave all this stuff together? Right. So I, I've written a bunch of books um, and. A number of them have been about games and play. And one of the one of the books, one of my second book, I think, was was this book called Persuasive Games, which was about uh, how games uh, can engage with uh, with topics outside of entertainment and how they can be re rhetorical tools, how they can make arguments and politics and journalism and education and learning. And I've spent a lot of time in my my life as a game designer uh, trying to make games that uh, that use the capacities of, of of the behavior in a system, which is what a game is made out of in order to, um, to show the complexity of, of worldly things. And I you know, made strange games about like tort reform and you know, immigration law, and uh, we made the first presidential election game in 2003 for uh, Howard, Howard Dean, which a long time ago. Uh, and none of that worked. Like, the short, short version is none of that really worked out. None of it really came to pass. And if you look at the media ecosystem today, it's, it's dominated by, um, by the forms of the 20th century, by the communication forms of the, of the 20th century, text, uh, images, moving images. Uh, and that, that was, a, it was a tough uh, lesson to learn in some ways, because it meant that some, either, either the arguments I'm making were incredibly prescient and will eventually come to pass, um, or that they required um, a situation that didn't exist, or else that there was something weirder and stranger about games that I wasn't, that I wasn't really finding. So in some sense, the, the book, while, while you don't have to know any of that to read the book, part of the motivation was an attempt to dig deeper, to, to kind of go underneath some of those assumptions I'd made uh, in the past about what was useful and legitimate about games and play. Um, because obviously, there had to be something uh, much, much more profound and, um, uh, and much more compelling, such that they remained uh, a kind of major touchstone for, for, for many people. And, 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 and the way that those, that those terms and those ideas have infected our language and our behavior in a way that we don't even know. Um, so that was part of it. Um, but then the other thing is I, I got mixed up with this weird group of uh, philosophers a few years back um, that practiced this, this kind of metaphysics that's become known as object-oriented ontology. This is like, a, you know. If you're interested in philosophy, this is, this is something you can pursue on, on, on your own, I guess. But, uh, and I wrote this book uh, in 2011 or 2012 or so called Alien Phenomenology, which was sort of in this tradition and about the, the experience of things. And you know, can we kind of think about things as having something uh, like experience? So this is kind of pan-experientialist take on metaphysics. Um, and this so sort also, of a proto uh, Marie Kondo. Uh, I mean, Marie Kondo's in here, as you know. Yeah, yeah. like you know, the, the difference, of course, is that I don't think you have to throw everything away if it doesn't make <laughs> you pleasurable. It doesn't doesn't give you pleasure. Um, so that was another thread. Like there, there was this sense I had that there was a relationship between play and ordinary stuff, and that the things that ordinary stuff could do, um, that that might have been an ingredient uh, uh, that I was missing. And then another thing that happened at this, around the same time, or a little bit before that. Um, is that I, it was related, this sort of interesting glue between them, uh, was a, a project that, uh, that I did in 2009 on the, on the Atari, on the 1977 Atari video game system, uh, video computer system. And uh, Nick Motford uh, and I wrote the, a book called Racing the Beam about the way that the, the hardware design of, of the Atari influenced the, the games that were made in the platform and then later Later games, and there was an, an attention to the to detail and, and kind of technical specificity in that book um, that made me think that actually the machine itself was kind of more interesting uh, than than the games and the experiences that that they created. Um, so all of those all of those threads, this this idea of of, of games and play is, is really really and truly having a a, a strong uh, connection to to human experience of all kinds. 
uh, but also having a strong uh, relationship with the ordinary and the everyday and of material things more than media or entertainment. Um, and then of, of a kind of sense of, um, of wonder and curiosity um, that there's a whole world, there's a whole universe of, of stuff taking place that we're not even noticing uh, as, as, we, as, we, as we dance between all of our, all of our individual goals. You know, those were, that was sort of the groundwork. And then the rest of it, I don't know, it emerged, it emerged from the, the conversation between those, um, those interests. Um, I think uh, for, for me, like one of, one of the ideas that I thought was um, uh, really interesting and really beautiful in the book is uh, something you just touched on, the idea that, um, that, the, that the, the meaning and value of um, things is, uh, it's, in the, it's in the things, it's not in us, and that that's a, it's a, a, a sort of right. a complicated emergent relationship. Do you, did you, do, should, we, should we do a, a reading from that? Um, I think it was the uh, play invites us. I don't remember if we, if we bookmarked that one. Yeah, I've got it here. Okay. Play invites us to draw an overdue conclusion that the potential meaning and value of things, anything, relationships, the natural world, packaged goods, is in them rather than in us. Play is not a kind of self-expression nor a pursuit of freedom. It is a kind of creation, a kind of craftsmanship even, by adopting, inventing, constructing, and reconfiguring the material and conceptual limits around us, we can fashion novelty from anything at all. Although they refer to poiesis, the, the, the making that grounds poetry instead of play, the philosophers Bert Dreyfus and Sean Kelly come to a similar conclusion about finding meaning in the secular age. The task of the craftsman is not to generate the meaning, but rather to cultivate in himself the skill for discerning the meanings that are already there. I, I think this is really important because um, there, we live in this age of, of plenty, of surplus. And, and there's, a, there's an anxiety or even a cognitive dissonance between the, the sense that we all know that we live in this era of, sort of, of complete overabundance, especially in the developed world, um, such that we are literally suffocating and drowning ourselves in it, and the, and the, and the simultaneous sense that we are miserable, that we can't make, we can't make good on it. Uh, and so that invitation, and this is kind of like a, an exercise that I, I mean, I, I literally engage in, you know, that no matter what it is that you're faced with, there's always something that can be done with it. There's always some secret that it hasn't yet released, and it just has to be sort of cradled in the right way such that it could be encouraged. Do you, do you I mean, to me, there's, there's sort of an implication there that like the artist also needs to be a critic and that there's a pretty close relationship there. And that's certainly true of your work because you, you, know, you, do, you do criticism and you make games. Do you, is, that, do you, do you, is that kind of prescriptive for you? Like, would you tell your students that they should, that, that to be a better game designer, you need to become a better critic? Well, I mean, I think that would, sure, but that's not always that easy. And, and in fact, you know, s some folks are more, um, are more inclined uh, to, to certain kinds of creation than others are. But you have to be willing to participate in that conversation, uh, I, I think. And the, the, you know, the exchange of ideas between the artist and the critic can sometimes be more productive when those are, are held within a, a singular individual, but sometimes it can just be uh, confusing. So if, if anything, it's an openness, an openness to, to sort of the, 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 uh, uh, the improvisational question, what else, right, and also. Uh, and that openness, you know, that, that can work whether you're a creator uh, or a critic, so long as we're really going to kind of reconfigure our understanding of things, which means that, which, which is really, I mean, this isn't in the book, but, but, but it's related to someone like Richard Rorty's idea of, 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 of irony or the ironist, is, is someone who's open to, to things they haven't yet considered. I think um, we have some time for some audience questions. So I think we, we will come to you with a microphone if you put your hands up. Your opinion of this high popularity of uh, Trump, is it because his uh, people who support him playing too many stupid games all the time? Oh, sorry, can you just, just one more time? We didn't catch Yeah, sure. Right. So uh, I'm asking what is your um, uh, opinion why Trump is so popular, Trump, so popular, so many people support him. Is it because they're playing stupid video game all the time? <laughs> oh, interesting. I see. Um, I mean, people are trying to make sense of the world. This is, this is what they're trying to do. And so, you know, when you have sense-making exercises, uh, explanations, 
that, that, that seem plausible or that acknowledge the material experience that you believe yourself to be enmeshed in, um, then they are appealing. Uh, they are appealing. And in some sense, that, that idea of revealing um, the, the, the hidden structures, the hidden limitations um, that are constructing the experience that you have, you know, whether you think those are ideological or whether you simply think that they're um, you know that they're 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 material and they're attacks from the outside, which is one of the one of the arguments that, that Trump is making. Um, then it creates uh, it creates clarity, and we want we want that kind of clarity. People want that kind of clarity, and everyone wants that kind of clarity, um, not just for someone else, but also for themselves. And there's certainly an argument to be made that um, that the way that that the political speech and and, and political action is functioned is by obfuscation uh, rather than by by clarity making. Um, although I don't think that that's exactly everything that's going on. I mean, I mean there's certainly s certain underlying predilections of the, uh, uh, of the American people that are, being, that are being shown never to have really left uh, when, we look at, when we look at Trumpism. Uh, well, I know this is, this is also like the question that like every, every game designer like hates being asked and thinking about, but I think it's just seeing the, the, the gamer kind of boys supporting yeah. Trump on Twitter, like I know we both get yelled at on, on Twitter by these folks, like, uh, I mean, is there, is there something to like, that, the, that there's like a generation of kids that have been raised with these like hyper-masculine power fantasies where all problems can be solved in like an orgy of violence and like the nuance of games, there was that great screenshot of like press A to vault over the grave or whatever, or like what was it? What was it like press A to kneel at the grave? You know, do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. It's right, like is right. that did that somehow set people up for like a like a like a dumb, a dark dumb political dialogue? Well, I mean, probably so, but but you know the, it's not sufficient. It's it's maybe one it's maybe one ingredient, but but also you know it's not just from it's not just from that that avenue that we're getting those kinds of simplistic explanations. I mean, we also have the idea that if we just aggregate enough data, then causality doesn't matter because correlation will tell us the truth. You know, and that's coming from the kind of libertarian, uh, the techno-libertarian uh, fold rather than the, uh, the sort of, you know, kind of, kind of uh, alt-right uh, fold. Um, but there is, I guess, a strong sense that, that if you can rationalize, if you can rationalize experience, if you can, if you can characterize it as having been produced by some known set of conditions, um, that this is uh, this is satisfying, and games do that. They give us answers because they themselves are arbitrary. And one of the reasons why why gamers as a category seem, at least in certain numbers, to be drawn to this sort of political thinking, is because you know games have been a place where where there were uh, clear and definitive answers. In, in a world of, of uncertainty, those arbitrary structures of the game were, were providing not just violence, not just like you know, kind of the the the, uh, the 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 male power fantasies that you're talking about, uh, but also clear, definitive structure in which to accomplish something. Whereas the world seems like like how could we possibly even start figuring out how to accomplish anything? And I think that might be more important than the than the, the power fantasies and the violence. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah, I guess yeah, that's pretty good. I'm wondering, yeah. just sort of in your day-to-day -day personal life, going to the mall yeah. either with your daughter or by yourself or whatever you do, what are some of the ways that you make the experience of suffocating in yeah. overabundance fun? Yeah, right. Or yeah. playful right. for yeah. you? And I, and I, 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 can't, I can't report that at breakfast, I, I personally saw Ian pass up a, a really good uh, a biscuit. Yeah, that's true. So. That's true. Yeah, yeah. In in this case, the constraint was a, a, a dietary choice. It's like once you choose not to eat a certain thing, then you don't have to ask any further questions. You're just like, I'm not, I'm not going to eat the crumpet. <laughs> uh, there, there's a bunch of stories in the in the book about my my ordinary life, which is going to seem like like you know like like really indulgent to some people, like my lawn and these these kind of weird hobbies. But the 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 exercise and and you know it is an exercise that I I have tried to live as I've been working on the book and after is one of, okay, you're, you know, you're faced with, with a thing, a problem, a scenario, a situation. Uh, what can I learn about it such that I could exert force upon it so I can begin to learn how to work with it uh, rather than against it or rather than to think that it is, it is somehow here like a, like a strange uh, you know, missile focused at my forehead, here, here to make me miserable, when in fact the reality is that it's, it's just here. It's just here and I'm here and it doesn't really care about me at all without descending into the, the, the nihilism that would easily accompany that sort of fatalism. Uh, so there's an invitation you know, at any given moment um, 
to ask, okay, you know, what is, first, what is this thing? What am, what am I even faced with? Uh, what can I do with it? And then usually, usually once you get that far in, the answers become apparent. And, there, and it turns out there's a whole universe worth pursuing underneath. Um, I mean, I have these examples in the book about mowing my lawn and, and brewing coffee and, uh, you know, and, and commuting. And, uh, and they, they almost always have to do with uh, you know, I, identifying exactly how something's working and how I can intervene in some manner, right? Um, and this also means that the things that I choose not just to spend time on, but to, to construe as worthy of my time have expanded substantially. So my interest in like writing books or articles or so forth to, to expand my, my egomaniacal you know, uh, 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 goal of, of, of being some sort of public figure or writer or what have you, like, that doesn't, that doesn't go away. I mean, it's, it's still delightful and, and, and difficult. Um, but equally, the, the drive home or the, uh, or the, the, the conflict, uh, the land use conflict that I'm having with my neighbor uh, or the, um, uh, yeah, or, you know, or, the, or the work of putting together dinner uh, 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 surprisingly for more people than, than I thought were coming. All of these things are, they have the same structure, which is here's some stuff in the world. What can you do? How do you respond? Uh, and the moment that you just accept, okay, well, here we are. Here we are together. Let's see what we can do. Um, then, then usually I discover um, not just that I'm interested, but that I'm maybe uh, irrationally interested, that maybe I need to pull back a little bit. And, and w one way of, of thinking about this is that um, if you go online and you look for forums, like, like internet forums for enthusiasts or, or, or hobby communities, for anything, these exist for anything, for knitting, for tuning your car, for coffee brewing. I mean, they really do exist for coffee brewing. I didn't know that, but then I discovered they do. Uh, you'll find that, that every single activity, everything, there are, um, there are people who are as obsessed with it and its intricate foibles as anything that you've ever thought about or anything that, you know, that, that would have occurred to you to be worthy uh, of obsession. And, and that ability to be fanatical, obsessive, um, foolish, there's a connection between foolishness and fun, right? That's, that's really all you need. Uh, and then there's just like this sort of infinite depth that, that, that can reveal itself if, if, if you choose to allow it to. I've recently uh, I've been enjoying the uh, Elevator fan community on YouTube, which I find it very soothing. <laughs> hey, of um, so I have, I guess it's my turn, I have this friend who argues with real heat and anger that the makers of, I guess what we call video games, computer games, phone games, design them to be addictive, i.e. in the same way that cocaine is, pleasure centers in the brain activated. And I think of her as being quite paranoid until I find myself spending one more minute playing some dumb game, which is basically teaching me to swipe in a certain time pattern mm -hmm. or whatever. So is she right? Is some pleasure we take in games, particularly these bright, shiny ones, is it physical? I mean, weirdly, it's not usually the bright, shiny ones. It's, it's usually these, these, these sort of seemingly stupid ones. So, you know, the, the, the yes, she's right to some extent. The, uh, the design of coin-op arcade games in the, in, the, in the late 70s and early 1980s were all built around uh, particular partial reinforcement strategies. Uh, and they had this, this name for it, which is coin drop, which is also common in the casino gambling industry, especially with, uh, with slot machines. So the, you, what you want to do is maximize uh, coin drop. You want to get as many coins into the machine as quickly as you can. And you do that normally by throwing people off of the machines again. You, know, you have a little experience. You have two or three minutes is the, was the target. For, uh, for arcade game play, for the average player. Uh, and then, of course, the experience of the expert player becomes acknowledging, okay, I know this game is trying to throw me off in two minutes. Can I get to the point where I can trick it into allowing me um, to go past that, 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 that goal? It's a little different with, uh, with gambling, of course, because the, 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 the odds tables are just baked into the, to the experience. There's a fantastic book on this subject called Addiction by Design uh, by Natasha Schull that I strongly recommend reading. And there's no question that not just games, but more and more of our technology, te technological experience is designed in exactly the same way as slot machines, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, they're trying to get you to, to spend a little bit of attention to come back in the, in the hopes that there's something, something new to be found. They'll give you this, this, little, this little shot of, uh, uh, of dopamine. Uh, and today's mobile games especially are, are designed explicitly in that, in that fashion. Uh, and they're designed not necessarily for the average player, but in order to get as many players in such that some of them can spend a lot of money 
uh, on these microtransactions in the same way that casinos are designed uh, for whales, which is the same word that the, uh, the, uh, the mobile game companies use for, for those high value customers. Um, but those are not, that's not the way that like Call of Duty is designed, you know? Uh, it's not the way that Candyland uh, is designed. So, you know, we tend to think of games as this monolithic uh, universe when in fact it's, it's not, you know, it, there's all these different types of games and all these different structures of games, just like there are all these different types and structures of, of the moving image uh, or of writing. Uh, so we have to zoom out a little bit and look at them, look at them individually while also acknowledging that those things really are going on and, and that they are insidious, but then we also take pleasure in, in, in rubbing up against those tests. You know, that's, that's why we like uh, uh, casino gambling, is in order to feel, in order to feel that machine daring you to put another coin inside of it. So uh, yeah, she's, she's, she's right, but that's not the whole story. I, I feel like I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't uh, bring up Cow Clicker. Do you, it's, I mean, it does come up in the book. Do you want to give, give like the Well, the, I mean, you know, I, I, so back in the day of farm, days of Farmville, uh, when Farmville was really popular on, on Facebook, uh, I made this game called Cow Clicker, which was this attempt to kind of, kind of satirize and, and poke fun at not just, cow, not just uh, uh, Farmville and games like it, uh, but the very experience of, of, of Facebook uh, uh, itself. And there was a cow, and you clicked on the cow, and then it moved, and uh, you, you came back in six hours to click it again. Uh, and, uh, and the whole thing like, totally ran away from me and, and was very successful in a perverse way that, that, uh, that turned out, and it, it took until this book for me to really accept it, that turned out not just to be the, I mean, it was a successful satire for sure, um, but it wasn't just that. It was also a, a, a delightful and very real playground for people um, to have this weird casual experience of, uh, of, of touching a drawing of a cow and then meeting other people um, and, and kind of having a, a, very, a very mild uh, 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 context in which, like what is the minimum possible experience that you could share with someone else? It's something like clicking a picture of a cow. Uh, and so I have to admit that both of those things were active, right? The, the satire worked, but it wasn't the whole story. Um, I have a question. Uh, I believe that you said that once you have the, once you have, uh, you've done something over and over and have the mastery of it, you get to fun quicker. Um, I've experienced that when I'm skiing, a new hill the, is difficult. It's not till I have the mastery that it becomes fun. On the other hand, when I'm at work, a routine item that I do every day, that's boring. But given something that I have to fit within your constraints that's difficult, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think what's happening is that your, your experience is happening on different scales, right? Like the, the scale of the repetitive activity, right, is one in which it's much harder to find novelty. The scale in which you, you kind of zoom out for that and you're doing the, 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 the kind of broader task of your job in which, yeah, there's some work I have to get through. Let me just do this as quickly as I can. And that's the fun part, maybe, right? How quickly can I get through these reports? Uh, and then, um, or the, but, the, but the experience of making, uh, uh, of, of making the game out of, out of the experience of boredom of the routine task. And then you move to the, to the, you know, to, to the place where there's novelty to be, to be found. But you have to have a depth of knowledge in order to even identify that that's the boring experience itself and that it's done in the interest of something else, uh, for example. We have time for one last question. Kids, young people, can, well, not only young people, but how much can one nurture playfulness or being able to play? Uh, because if playfulness is a, if it is, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken here, it's, it's an ability to enjoy your world around you in a way. Can a kid, can you help in the schools? It's a question of creativity, approaching the world. And that's one part. The other part is, it seems to me there's enough games in this world without having to go to computer games. Why don't we just live out the games that are around us instead of buying a game or sitting for hours in front of a, some game, there's yeah, reasons I mean, for it. Yeah, I, mean, it. I, I, I certainly agree with the, with, the, with, the, with the second statement. But there is also delight in playing the games that are uniquely made possible uh, by the computer. I mean, I, I mean obsession is always a, a, a double-edged sword um, because it's through obsession that, that we develop uh, uh, mastery uh, and through mastery that, that then we can discover uh, deep knowledge. 
but then at the same time, uh, uh, some things seem arbitrary as obsessions. Uh, you know, and, and whether it's, it's, it's wise to have a singular obsession, maybe that's the problem. Like if we can have multiple obsessions, then at least we can transition and move, and move between them. As for the business of children, um, there's a sense that we have that you know, kids are somehow really good at play, and then we beat that out of them. We beat out the creativity through, through routinization and, uh, and through schooling and through r rules and restrictions. But I think what it really is is that, um, that children, children exist in a world that was not designed uh, for them. Uh, they don't have the ability to, to make the choices that, that adults do. They're always sort of uh, uh, restricted by the situation they're in. They're small. Uh, they, they can't get in the car and go wherever they want. And so their capacity to exercise this, this kind of playful tendency um, is amplified by the, the increased force of constraint that's already around them. Um, at the same time, we simultaneously seem to feel like, well, you know, kids can never seem to engage with the world at the, like, oh, I'm just gonna go and, I just wanna watch television instead of doing something else, which relates to that, that sort of multiple obsessions thing. Um, I, you know, I think the, the problem of, of motivation or the problem of, um, of engagement is certainly not one that's, that's limited to kids. Uh, and it, it all comes down to this fundamental question of how can, how can you imagine a, a, a deep obsession or a deep commitment to anything whatsoever. And if you run that exercise constantly, then it becomes like a kind of exercise. It's almost like working a muscle. Uh, you know, here's a stick, figure out what you can do with the stick, which is a kind of natural thing that kids would engage in, but that adults would, would find arbitrary and pointless. Uh, but the more that you do that, okay, here's the situation, here's, you, you know, you've gotta go to grandma's house. Like, where do you come up with something to, to, to talk to grandma about? Uh, okay, we're gonna go on a long car ride. How, wh what are we gonna do to, to put in the car? You, you, you've gotta go to school and you know that you're, you're good at this subject and, and not so good at this one, or you have a, a, a conflict with a, uh, with, with a student or with a teacher. Let's kind of, if, you, if you can discretize and look at every moment or every situation as one that is playable, as one that has these material constraints and the question, it's a matter of taking them seriously. So really seriously taking them um, as, uh, uh, as problems to be solved, not, not a sort of, oh, just get over it, you know, just so we can get on to the, to the good part. And I think that's a lesson for adults as much as, as, much as, for, as much as for children. Well, thanks. I think we, uh, uh, there's going to be a signing outside, and books will be available right outside, downstairs. And uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. That's fun.